chapter number eight. I want to say thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to be here with you for coming and for sitting under the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. And uh, we're just excited about what the Lord has been doing and what the Lord wants to do here with you. And uh, thanks so much for the invitation, Pastor Funkhauser. Well, have you noticed that there is all kinds of things that are in short supply today? There's just it seems to be shortages everywhere uh, that you go. There's a labor shortage, it seems like. Uh, no matter where you go, there's signs up that say that uh, they're, they're hiring and, and all these different things. I was up in uh, Newberry here just the other day, and I mean, every place up there, every restaurant has the signs out, you know, that they're, they're hiring. And uh, I want to ask a question to you. What, what happens if there's no laborers at the, at the place where you want to go eat? It takes forever to get your food, doesn't it? And you have to wait a long time, don't you? My parents went into Cracker Barrel. Uh, this would have been several months ago now. And uh, they went in and they asked for a place uh, to sit. And uh, the hostess there looks at them and says, Well, it's going to be about 45 minutes. And my dad looked around and into the room and it was empty. There was nobody in there eating. And he looks back at the lady and says, There's nobody in there. And she says, Well, sir, we only have one waitress that showed up to work today. Right? And uh, so I'm telling you, you know, labor shortages have an impact on us, don't they? Uh, I went to eat at a Denny's uh, this summer uh, with a pastor friend of mine. And Denny's is slow anyway, right? And they even had a sign on the door. We, we should have known, right? The sign on the door said, hey, we're experiencing staff difficulties, right? Well, we went in there and waited an hour for pancake and eggs, right? And, uh, you know, we, we're impacted by these labor shortages. Uh, we were in Minnesota here just a couple of weeks ago and uh, they were having a men's shooting event. Uh, we were going to get together, shoot 22s and some high-powered rifles and then we're going to shoot some uh, clays right, and have shotguns and everything. Have you tried to buy ammunition lately? There's an ammunition shortage. I, I was curious just the other day. I, I was up here and I was in Walmart and you know usually in Walmart you can at least find shotgun shells, right? But there's not a shotgun shell in sight. You, you can't find them. The only thing they had was extremely overpriced ammunition for 22s. And I'm like, I am not paying even anywhere remotely close to the price. That, but the shelves are just empty, right? There's an ammunition shortage. And the price has just gone through the roof astronomically, as you know, if you buy that sort of thing. Do you remember when COVID first started and uh, what was in major demand at that time? There was a shortage of it? Toilet paper. Toilet paper, right? Now, what happens when you don't have toilet paper? Now, don't answer that question, all right? Don't answer that question. But the point is, man, there's shortages everywhere. And shortages have an effect, don't they? They have a negative effect on us. Now, I want to ask you a question tonight. What happens when there's a shortage of soul winners? What happens when there's a shortage of soul winners? Winners. Can I tell you what I believe happens? I believe that people don't get saved. When there's a shortage of people who are willing to share the gospel, when there's a shortage of soul winners who are willing to do the work one by one, then people don't get saved. You say, now, nah, preacher. Hold on just a minute. You're getting a little bit too worked up about this. If it's God's will that some person is going to be saved, then they're going to be saved whether or not I talk to them or not. God will see to it that someone else will take the gospel to them. I want you to know, I'm going to stand here in this pulpit today and I'm going to categorically deny that statement. If that's what you think, I believe the Bible says that you are just wrong. Hey, my Bible says in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 4 that God will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. My Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So my Bible tells me that it is God's will that all will be saved. And I have to ask you a question. Are all people being saved? 
No. So is God's will being accomplished in this area of salvation of sinners? It is not. Because God's will is that every person would be saved. So we cannot sit here and say that, you know what, if I don't share the gospel with somebody, God is under the obligation because it's His will that that person be saved. He'll get somebody else to them to be saved. Listen to me. God's will is that everybody would be saved. It is our responsibility to get the gospel to our generation. God has saved you. Praise the Lord. It is our responsibility as a saved of this generation to take the gospel to the lost of this generation. My Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse number 14, How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? My Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 4, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Listen, people are lost and they're going to stay lost unless the glorious light of the gospel message is shined unto them so that they can believe. My Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 20, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, in the place of Christ, we pray you, be ye reconciled to God. My Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 4 that it is us, it is we, who have been put in trust with the gospel. So then we are stewards of the gospel. And I want to make this statement, if we are not soul winners, then we are not being good stewards of that which God has entrusted to us. My Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse number 8, When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that man shall die in his iniquity. But I will require his blood at thine hand. The Bible teaches that if there are no soul winners, then there won't be anyone getting saved. Soul winning is not something that the Christian should get to decide if they want to do or not. Either you are a soul winner or you are a backslidden and disobedient Christian. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 20. We've already looked at it. But we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God to beseech you by us. What does that mean? There are lost people and it is our job to take the gospel to them and beseech them in the place of Christ that they would trust Jesus to be saved. We are to act in the place of Christ to take the gospel message to them. 1 Thessalonians 2 and 4 talks about the fact that we have been entrusted with the gospel message. I always thought it would be great, Pastor Funkhauser, if God would have just written John 3.16 in the clouds, right? And it was always up there in the sky. Then everybody could look up and they could see how to be saved. But that was not God's plan. God gave us the gospel. If you know the gospel, if you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then it is your God-given responsibility to be sharing that message with anybody and everybody that you can. Amen. The average Bible preaching church today may preach the gospel to one, maybe two lost people each and every week. There's a, that's four hours. That's Sunday school. That's the Sunday morning service, that's the Sunday evening service, and that's the Wednesday service. Friends, there are more people than that in this world that we need to reach. And preaching the gospel in this building to one or two lost people every week is just not going to get the job done. However, a soul winner, one soul winner, they can go out into this community and they can preach the gospel one on one. But to, to between five to ten individuals in any given two-hour period. So in half the time, we can reach people with the gospel message. I'm not saying everybody that hears it is going to get saved. You can redo five to ten times what the church is going to do in a week by just taking the gospel outside the walls of these church. Imagine if you had two soul winners. Two soul winners could take the gospel and in two hours, they could double that number and they could preach the gospel to ten to twenty people in two hours. Triple that number, quadruple that number, 
Five times that number, five soul winners went out. You could preach the gospel to 25 to 50 people in two hours. Half the time that you spend in church each week, and the church is only going to preach the gospel to maybe one or two lost people, if that. Friends, soul winning is important. Sharing the gospel is important. It is the way that God has intended for us to share the message of salvation with those who are lost. Why aren't there more people in church? Well, Brother Duke, there aren't more people in church because it's the latter days and there's nothing we can do about it. I say baloney. Why aren't there more people in church? Because there's nobody doing soul winning today. Nobody's doing it anymore. Why aren't there more people in Sunday school? Well, you don't understand, preacher. People aren't just going to come to Sunday school. I say baloney. Why aren't there more people in Sunday school today? Because there's no soul winning. We're not sharing the gospel with people. We're not talking to people. We don't care about people to share the love of Christ with them so that they won't have to spend an eternity in hell so that they can spend an eternity in heaven for the rest of their life. Why don't we have more kids in church? Why don't we have more teenagers? Why don't we have a youth group? Well, preacher, you know, it's just that time people aren't just going to come to a church like this. They're not going to come to an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, King James, Bible-thumping, Bible-preaching, Baptist church. They're just not going to do it. And I say baloney. There are churches all over this country who stand on the same truths that this church right here stands. They use the same Bible that this church preaches. They have the same music that this church uses, and they're growing like crazy. Why is that? Because they are a soul-winning church and they care enough about the lives of lost people to get out in their community and to talk to people about the single thing that matters most, more than anything that you could talk to anybody about. They care about the souls of people and they care about the souls of people enough to get out and talk to people that they've never met before so that they can trust the Lord Jesus Christ to be their Savior. You're saying, Dustin, you're getting worked up tonight. Yes, I am. We need a revival in this country. And it needs to be a revival of soul winning. A revival of sharing the gospel, of taking the gospel message outside the walls of the church and into the community where the lost people live. Now you're in Acts chapter number 8, and I want us to pick it up in verse number 26. For the first point I want us to look at tonight is this, that soul winners are commanded to get up and to go. Soul winners are commanded to get up and go. Now if you were with me two years ago, you've already heard me go through Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 9, and Acts chapter number 10. We're going to go through them again here tonight because this is so very important. For some of you, you may have heard this from me before. And I encourage you to listen because there'll be some emphasis that wasn't there two years ago when I was preaching this material. Listen, I preach this material everywhere that I go. And I just love preaching this material. Because in Acts chapter number 8, there's a man by the name of Philip. You see him there in Acts chapter number uh, 8, verse number 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip. Okay? In this passage, I just want to tell you what happens. Okay? God speaks to Philip and says, hey, I want you to go down to the desert. He goes down to the desert and he finds an Ethiopian eunuch there and he's reading the Bible and he's desiring for some man to teach him what it means. Okay? And he goes down there to the desert. He, he goes up to the Ethiopian eunuch right? and uh, he, he talks to him. He tells him about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Ethiopian eunuch gets saved and then by the end of the chapter the Ethiopian eunuch gets baptized. Okay? So what happened here? There's a soul winner. His name is Philip. He got up and he went and he did what God wanted him to do. And as a result, there was a soul that trusted Christ as a Savior. In Acts chapter number 9, uh, you can look at it there in verse number 10. Of course, this is uh, the story here where Saul is on the road to Damascus and he sees the light from heaven in the first nine verses there. And uh, he's told to go into town. It'll be told to him what he must do. And in verse number 10 it says, And there was a certain disciple at, Anani at Damascus excuse me, named Ananias. And to him... The Lord said, okay? So here he speaks to a disciple by the name of Ananias. He says, I want you to go over and I want you to talk to this guy Saul and I want you to explain the gospel to him. And he eventually does it. He goes there and Saul gets saved and he becomes Paul and he writes most of our New Testament and he plants churches all across that area and turns the world upside down, 
And in Acts chapter number 10, we have a man named Cornelius. All right, chapter 10 and verse number 1, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian band. Cornelius is lost. God speaks to him in a vision and tells him to send for one Peter. So God talks to Peter. Peter comes down. He meets Cornelius. He shares the gospel with Cornelius. And by the way, Cornelius had a group of friends gathered around. And Cornelius and everybody else that he had gathered there with him, his friends and his family, they trust the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as their Savior. So in Acts chapter number 8 and verse number 26, now that we kind of know what these three chapters are about, I would like for you, if you take notes in your Bible, to circle three words in Acts chapter 8 and verse number 26. The Bible says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, here's the three words, Arise and go. Do you see that there? Arise and go. That's where I get the words, get up and go. All right. The first point is that soul winners are commanded to get up and to go. So he did. Philip obeyed. He got up and he went. And because he got up and he went, he was able to share the gospel with somebody and they were able to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now look in Acts chapter 9 and verse number 11. All right, we've already looked at verse number 10 where uh, he's speaking to Ananias. And in verse number 11, And the Lord said unto him, and if you want to take notes in your Bible, I'd circle the next three words. What are the next three words? Arise and go. It's exactly the same words that were given to Philip in Acts chapter number 8. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called straight. Ananias does. He gets up and he goes. And as a result, he's able to lead a man to Christ. Look in Acts chapter number 10 and verse number 20. All right. Now here, our words are still there. The same three words we were looking for, but they're separated just a little bit. All right. But the Bible says, Arise. So there's the first word that we're looking for. Therefore, and get thee down and Go, right? I have my Bible kind of circled out there in a kind of a, a weird shape, but it is those same three words to arise and go. I just want to pause here for a moment, right? And I want us to think about something. In Acts chapter number 8, God speaks to Philip, says, Get up and go down here, and I'm going to want you to talk to somebody. Okay? Had he ever met that person before? He never had, hadn't he? In other words, God tells Philip, to go down to the desert and talk to an absolutely, perfectly complete stranger. Someone he's never met before in his life. And the first time he ever meets them, he gets saved. Isn't that exciting? Okay. Acts chapter number 9. Alright, God speaks to Ananias. says, I want you to go down here and talk to Saul. From my understanding of the scriptures, Ananias had never met Saul before. Anybody who met Saul ended up dying or getting put in jail. Alright, getting dying. Are you listening to me? Getting killed or put in jail, right? So he had heard about him, all right? But he'd never met him before. So Ananias and goes and talks to a complete and total perfect stranger. Shares the gospel with him. And the first time they meet, they get saved. Isn't that exciting? Amen. Acts chapter number 10. God's talking to Peter. Peter goes over and visits Cornelius. He'd never met Peter before. Oh, excuse me, he never met Cornelius before. He had never met any of Cornelius' friends before. And yet the very first time they meet, complete and total, perfect strangers, shares the gospel with them, and they trust the Lord Jesus Christ to be their Savior. You know, has God given us a similar command? Mark chapter 16, verse number 15. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to who? To your friends? To your family? To your co-workers? Yes, all of those things. But beyond that, to every creature, even those that you don't know. Perfect and total strangers, friends, are game for you as a soul winner to be able to talk to and to share the gospel with. Um, we were, I was being preached to, all right, up in uh, Minnesota, and uh, he was preaching through uh, the book of Jonah in the Old Testament. Okay? And you don't have to turn back there, all right, and I cheated and I bookmarked it before the service started, right? But in Jonah chapter number one, the Bible says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, in verse number two, it says, Arise, go. You know, this is nothing new. God has always expected those who are going to be soul winners for him to get up, and to go. Okay? And then over in chapter number 3, when Jonah gets his second chance, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, and in verse number 2, Arise, go. 
By the way, I have those circled in my Bible as well. Because if you want to be a soul winner, God is telling you as a Christian that you're going to have to get up and you're going to have to go. And if you do, you can expect the same kind of results that they had. Because they got up and they went and they saw people trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. This is a command to get up and to go. Or with the Great Commission, to go, whether you look at it in Mark or whether you look at it in Matthew. It is a command to us. And a command is an authoritative order. Okay? Now, I had a mother growing up, right? And did your mother, when you were growing up, they ever give you authoritative orders? Right? Uh, my mother told me, Dustin, go clean your room. Yes, ma'am. And I went and cleaned my room. Because I knew if I didn't clean my room, I was going to be in serious trouble. Any toy that was out, when it shouldn't be out, she was going to take it away. I wasn't going to be able to play with it for a couple of weeks. And I didn't want that to happen. You with me? I understood what an order was. And when my mom gave me an order, I knew I better get in line and I better do it. God is giving to us an order. And it is not an order from your mother. It is an order from God. The creator God of the universe. The one who sustains and gives us life. Is saying to us, get up and go and share the gospel. If Philip in Acts chapter number 8 had disobeyed, he would have been sinning God's command telling him to go. If Ananias had disobeyed, he would have been sinning against God there in Acts chapter number 9. If Peter had disobeyed, he would have been sinning. If Jonah had disobeyed, oh wait a minute, Jonah did disobey, right? We know what happened to him. He ended up getting swallowed by a fish and then getting vomited out by a fish. And then God gave him a second chance to do the same thing he told him to do the first time. And Jonah was sinning when he went the other way. And we are sinning when we choose to not get up and to go. The lack of soul winning is a sin of omission, not a sin of commission. In other words, it's not something that you do that is sinful. You are sinful by not doing it. It is a sin of omission. If you do not win souls to Christ, you are disobeying God's command, which, the way I read the Bible, is sin. Number two, Understanding that we're all told to be soul winners. Understanding we're all told to get up and go. Point number two is this. Soul winners struggle with getting up and going. Okay? Maybe, maybe we can take some... Uh, we, we can identify all right, with these people in this way. All right? Acts chapter number 9. All right, let's, let's go there. Let's take a look at it. All right? Acts chapter number 9. We already know that God has come and he's talked to Ananias and he's told him that he needs to go talk to one Saul. All right? And then I want you to look at it in verse number 13. All right? So God's talked to him, says, go talk to Saul. And then in verse number 13, then Ananias answered, said, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call upon thy name. In other words, he's having a conversation with God about what God has told him to do. All right? God has said, hey, I want you to get up and I want you to go and I want you to talk to Saul. And he says, God, hold on a minute. Do you really know what you were asking me to do? Don't you know who this guy is? Okay? This is the one who is killing people. This is the one who has papers with him to arrest me and to put me in jail. You can't be serious, God. You really don't want me to go talk to him, do you? Right? And by the way, in the next verse, God says, yes, I'm serious. I want you to go talk to him. Okay? So we can struggle with the get up and go. Ananias struggled to get up and to go. Look in Acts chapter number 10 in old Peter. Peter, he's all confused. He, he can't figure out what in the world the, the, the vision that God has given to him means. And, and in verse number 19, it says, While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee, arise therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Why did he say that? Because back up in verse number 17, the Bible says, Now while Peter doubted in himself. Listen, Peter had his doubts. Peter didn't want to go visit Cornelius. 
All right? Peter was a Jew. Jews weren't supposed to go visit Gentiles. Peace people, Jews weren't supposed to eat in Gentiles' houses. They weren't supposed to do what God was asking him to do here. And he had all kinds of doubts about it. And he was debating in himself whether or not he should do it. And God said, yes, this is what I would like for you to do. Did Jonah struggle just a little bit? I'd say so. He got up and went 180 degree opposite direction. He tried to get as far away from Nineveh as he possibly could. And God found a way to bring him back, right? And to give him a second chance to go. He obviously struggled with being able to go to the Ninevites where God had called him to go to preach the gospel. Now in Acts chapter number 8, we find Philip there. Right? And God tells him to arise and go. And I'll tell you what, Philip just obeys. He just immediately obeys. He doesn't really struggle with the get up and going. And I want to suggest to you that the reason why is because God has already been using him to win a whole bunch of people to Christ earlier in that chapter. Or as he went down to Samaria and there, there was so much happening that, that the apostles had to come down to help with the work that was taking place there. And so in other words, he already had experience. He knew that he was supposed to get up and go and he was excited about getting up and going because of past experiences and he did so I want to tell you listen it's maybe you struggle maybe you struggle to obey this command maybe you struggle to get up and to go maybe you struggle to open your mouth to share the gospel with other people and here's what I want to say to you join the club it's a big club the Apostle Peter is in it the disciple Ananias is in it. I am sure that Philip is in it at some point before we read him about him there in Acts chapter number 8. The prophet Jonah is in that club. I am in that club. I bet Pastor Henry is in that club. And I would bet that you are in that club as well. Do you ever struggle with getting up and going and sharing the gospel with people? The answer would be yes. And I would just say, listen, so does everybody else. So does everybody else. Have you ever had a conversation with God trying to justify why witnessing doesn't make any sense? Yes, I have. Have you ever had a conversation with God making sure that He really wants you to go and talk to some perfect stranger about Him? God, you can't be serious. You really don't want me to talk to this person over here who, while he's pumping his gas. Hey, I've been there. I've done that. I've had those conversations with God. Have you ever had a conversation with God where you just flat out argued with Him and told Him, No, I'm out soul winning. I have, and I bet you have too. And I would just say that, listen, everybody struggles with this. Ananias did not want to speak to Paul. Peter did not want to speak to Cornelius. Jonah, absolutely no way, shape, or form did he want to speak to the Ninevites. Hey, soul winners struggle to get up and to go. But number three, all right? Number one, we're commanded to get up and go. Number two, I realize we struggle obeying that command to get up and to go. And by the way, everybody in the Bible struggles with it too. Okay? First number, or, or point number three, soul winners, in the end, they get up and they go. Okay? I realize it's tough. I realize it's a struggle. I realize your flesh doesn't want to do it. I realize sometimes every part of you doesn't want to do it. Okay? But in the end, soul winners push through it and they get up and they go. In Acts chapter number 9, verses 15 through 17, Ananias overcomes his fears about going to preach to Saul. And he went and he preached to Saul and he saw God saved. In Acts chapter number 10, Peter put his doubts behind him and he went to see Cornelius. Jonah, now it took an awful lot of effort, but he eventually went to the Ninevites. He pushed through the struggles. He pushed through the fears. Which one will you be? Will you be the, well, Philip, he didn't really struggle. He just obeyed and he went, right? Which one will you be? Will you be the soul winner who overcomes his fears? Will you be the soul winner who puts his doubts behind him and finally says, you know what, I'm going to start doing this? Will you be the soul winner who just jumps in head first like Philip? Yes, sir, Lord, I'll go. Just put me in the right direction and I'll go. Or will you be the soul winner who jumps at the second chance to do the same thing God's been asking you to do or the third chance or the fourth chance or the fifth chance or whatever it may be? Soul winners push through the struggles and in the end, they get up and they go. Number four, soul winners know that if God has commanded them to get up and to go, it is because God is already at work 
where He has called you to go. Now this is very exciting truth. And this helps me probably more than anything as a soul winner, Pastor Funkhauser. In Acts chapter number 8, God speaks to Philip and says, I want you to go down to the desert. Why did God tell him he wanted to go, he t- to go down to the desert? Why did God tell him to do that? Because God knew that the Ethiopian eunuch was going to be in the desert. You, you understand? God was already there. God was already where he told Philip to go. And so all Philip then had to do was say, Yes, sir, I'll join right in. I'll go wherever he asked me to go. And after he goes, he figures out why it was that God wanted him to go. When he got down there, he found a man who was reading the Scriptures. God was already there. God was already over him, all over him. He was reading Isaiah 53. He didn't know what it meant. And all Philip had to do was just tell him about Jesus. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? Could God do that for you? Has God told you to go? He has told you to go. Has God placed you in prosperity? He has placed you in prosperity or one of these surrounding areas, right? God has told you to go where you are. And if you will go, you will find there's reasons why you're going. Because God's at work in the lives of lost people to bring them to a saving knowledge of Himself. In Acts chapter number 9. No, I think I already talked about Acts chapter number 9. Yeah, he got over his fear to go see Saul. Peter got over his fear. Uh, well, what am I doing here? I got off in my spot in my notes down here, right? But Philip, he went down. And we talked about that one. Philip went down, right? And he found the Ethiopian eunuch. Ananias, whenever God talked to him, he decided, all right, I'm going to go talk to Saul. Okay? God laid a very specific individual on his heart to go speak to. He went and spoke to him, and when he got there, he realized why. He didn't know all about that. He didn't know about the road to Damascus. He he didn't know any of that stuff. Ananias didn't. But when he went, he found that God was already working where God had told him so clearly to go. And then he was able to see that person trust Christ as his Savior. In Acts chapter number 10, Peter overcame his doubts. He went to visit Cornelius. And when he got there, he realized why he was called there. Because God was already at work there. And it wasn't just Cornelius, it was Cornelius and all of his friends, and they were ready to learn the way of salvation. And when they heard it, they accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. So we can take heart in that, that if God is asking you to go somewhere, it's because God is already where He is asking you to go. Number five, soul winners preach Jesus when they get to where they're going. Soul winners just preach Jesus. Okay? Acts chapter number 8, verse number 35. The Bible says, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Acts chapter 9, verse number 17. The Bible says, And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, hast sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter number 10, and verse number 38. Or verse number 34. Then Peter, Peter opened his mouth, and in verse number 38, and talked about how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. You know the message that God has given you to be a soul winner, don't you? It's the message of Jesus. It's the message that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, whose name is Jesus. He died on the cross. He died for their sins. He was buried. He was resurrected. And by the way, soul winners, you get to share the best message that there ever was to tell anybody about. All these people, they preach Jesus to complete strangers. People they'd never met before. And they saw those complete strangers trust Christ as their Savior the very first time they ever spoke with them. Could God, could, could, could God do that with you? Yes, He could. Does God want to do that with you? Yes, He does. If you will recognize the commandment to be a soul winner, overcome your struggles to becoming a soul winner, and get up and go like all soul winners must eventually do, Comfort yourself knowing that God is at working where He is asking you to go and simply preach Jesus to them when you get there. You can be a powerful soul winner. Curtis Hudson said it this way, The only alternative to soul winning is disobedience to Christ. 
Another preacher of yesteryear said it this way, the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. I don't know about you, but I want the gospel to get there in time. The title of the message is simply this, get up and go. God has commanded you to do that. The invitation tonight is going to be extremely simple. If you will, deal with the Lord. And you will say, Lord, I will commit to going. I've got struggles, I've got fears, I've got doubts, I've got concerns. But I want to become a soul winner. Then I'd like for you to do business with God about that. Okay? There may be some things that you need to do that are uncomfortable. You may have to talk to people you've never talked to before. Complete strangers. But listen to you, that's what God's asking you to do. He wants you to take the message of the gospel on His behalf as an ambassador of Christ and beseech others in His place about the gospel which He has put into your trust and to which we are stewards. Would you stand to your feet? Father, I want to thank You for the Word of God. I want to thank You for its clarity. And God, I want to thank You for its pointedness. God, I need the pointedness of the Scripture in my own life. I need those commands, Lord, that help me to know what it is that You are expecting of me as a Christian. Father, I preached hard tonight. Father, I pray for each person that's listening here. Lord, they're all going to be given a choice in a few moments to respond in an invitation, Lord, about becoming a soul winner, about sharing the gospel more than they have been, Lord, about taking the gospel to people they don't know, to strangers, or the same way that it happens here in the New Testament. And God, I just ask that your will and your way would be done in this invitation. With every head bowed and every eye closed, listen, the altar is open. You can make an altar of your seat, whatever it may be. I just ask that you do business with the Lord, however He's spoken to your heart tonight, as we have a few minutes of silence, just to consider what God is asking for us to do. To go into all the world and to preach the gospel. Father, I want to thank you for what you're doing in our hearts and lives. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to be here this week. And God, I want to thank you for the abundant amount of patience that you have shown with me, Lord, and the struggles, Lord, that I have gone through in my own life, Lord, of not wanting to share the gospel with others and of thinking that it's just ineffective and it doesn't work and all of the wrong thinking, Lord, that has been there in my own life. God, I want to thank you for the patience. I want to thank you for the multiple opportunities, for continued opportunities, Lord, that you asked me to get up and go. Father, I pray for these people, Lord, that they would have been challenged tonight to get up and go, fight through the uncomfortableness of it, and Lord, to be able to share the gospel and see people saved. Lord, thank you for the message of the gospel. Lord, what a powerful effect it had in my life and those that are here tonight who are saved. God, we want to thank you for that. Father, we ask for opportunities to share that message with other people. Lord, we love you. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to turn the service over here in a moment to Pastor Funkhauser. But before I do that, I'm going to turn the service over to Brother Kuhn, who has a presentation he would like to make. think about it, that there's the months or pastor appreciation month. And so, I don't know whether it's grandparents are going to get
praise the Lord for that. Uh, thank you guys so much uh, for the love and for the cards. Uh, I was thinking of brother, what Brother Dustin Duke was preaching on just a little while ago, and he told me when he first came to Ambassador, that, I mean, this was a whole new concept to him. He didn't want anything to do with it. And uh, the same with me. I never, I, it just never even dawned on me. This is what people do. But, uh, you know, he was talking about those who you never come in contact with. You know, my Bible tells me even those who persecute you, he, he says, have an honest conversation as Gentiles toward those those who, who, who are mean-spirited towards you. They may see through, through your good works, and they may glorify God on your behalf. That's what Peter tells us. And over in chapter 3, he says, uh, even if you have an unbelieving husband, that you're able to win him over by your chaste conversation, by the godliness in your own spirit. And so even in your own home, you're able to be a soul winner. Somebody uh, wrote Gypsy Smith, and he told him, he says, <laughs> this is a woman, by the way, she says, uh, uh, brother, she says, uh, God has called me to be a preacher, but, uh, you know, I have all these kids, and uh, there's no way I can be a preacher with all these kids. He said, honey, uh, you already have 12 kids in your congregation. You minister to them. You know, so we have our own homes to reach for the glory of God, and that's the best best ones we can reach. And so that's not an excuse not to go out. I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm giving my 10 cents worth, so uh, praise the Lord. I I love what I do. I really do. And so uh, each and every one of you, Kempler Hawkins, Brother Coon has been trying to reach. Brother Wayne, your fishing buddy, you've been trying to reach. Brother Tim, uh, Ed's been trying to reach. Uh, I think uh, your bunch of them, you've been trying to, you know, you, you do all their dear me for them and you try to witness to them. Keep it up, brother. Keep it up. And even Brother Frank tells me about his neighbor across the street. He's been trying to reach. And, and so praise the Lord, Miss Kim, those that are workplace. Keep it up. Keep it up. You've got to be faithful. And that's what it takes. You know, they don't maybe not do anything the first day or the second day or whatever. Faithfulness uh, is the key. So uh, little is much when God is in it. We're going to sing that in conclusion. Uh, let me find the page number here. Just 397. Amen. 397. We're going to sing the first, uh, the second, and the fourth verse. 397. First, second, and fourth. If you allow me and permit me just one more, uh, I was at the Southwide Fellowship. There's a, a guy, he comes to Ambassador once in a while, not all the time, uh, over the uh, Faith Track League. His name is Tom Patterson. He was a missionary. Uh, he wanted to be a missionary over to Norway, but he couldn't go. I mean, he went through all the deputations. There's something happened, I forget what. But he ended up going down to Somalia, and he said, Lord, this is the furthest place. <laughs> I, I didn't want to go to Somalia. You remember Black Hawk Down and all this. And so he was over there in Somalia and ministering, and he hadn't been there very long. Met a girl from Norway, and uh, she was trying to run away from her parents and everything like that. I mean, he was able to get her connected with a good church. Went back to Norway. An amazing story. Don't have time to tell that one. 
But uh, he was passing out tracks, and they couldn't get any results out of passing out tracks. He said, uh, for some reason or another, they didn't want tracks, they wanted Bibles. And uh, so he, he's coming back, his wife had health concerns, came back, and uh, so nonetheless, through the grapevine, he, he says, they want Bibles, all the Bibles that you can get. And even the, the guy, I, I forget what they call him, uh, uh, not a king, I forget what they call him back then. But one of the higher ups, you understand what I'm saying, of the country. He says, I have one condition. He says, I want Bibles, but only on one condition. As long as they're King James Version Bibles, that's all we want in the country. And uh, this, he said, he got a hold of uh, a Christian book distributors up in Maryland, Peabody, Maryland. Got a hold of them. He says, I want Bibles at cost. They said, at cost? He says, I mean, no, no, we're not able to get any. We, we talked about that cost. They called him back a short time later. He got those Bibles at cost. It's just really, he's telling me this all last week. He says, I got Bibles. All kinds of Bibles. I got hundreds and hundreds. I got containers of Bibles waiting to go to Somalia. And I wish I just had somebody to go. Isn't that amazing? They want Bibles down there. He said that you can go in and you can preach to the police station. You can preach in the schools. Only on one condition. If you preach out of the King James Version Bible, that's the only condition. They said, we just want somebody who will go. And uh, there's somebody just like myself who was just waiting for them to tell them about the Lord. And so praise the Lord for that. I, I, I end it. Let's, uh, Brother Mike, would you close us in a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Amen. We got cupcakes and ice cream in the back, and I hope you'll stick around for that and uh, spend time with the Dukes before they leave out tomorrow for their missions conference.